Today we're going to look at some of my favourite books and in these videos I want to share with you books, a random selection of the books that have really meant a lot to me. Some of them go way back, some of them are more recent and uh, like all people's list of favourite books it, it does change from time to time but I want to try and pick the ones that have really influenced me as a writer, the books that have really made me rethink the way I read, we think rethink the way I write, um, the books that have made me question what you can do with storytelling and ask more of the stories that I read as well as the stories that I write. There will be books that have inspired me as a reader and as a writer. So the first of my favourite books that I want to share with you today is um, a book by Beryl Bainbridge, who's <coughs> one of my all-time favourite writers, and the book is called The Birthday Boys. And because I've been having a good old clear out and lending books to people and trying to make some space in my bookshelves, I don't have an actual physical copy of this one. I only have the ebook version, so I've got you the cover to look at. This is one of the most recent cover. Here you are. Beryl Bainbridge, The Birthday Boys. And I think that's quite a fab cover. This book is a fictionalised account of Scott's doomed expedition to the South Pole. And I think... There are two or three things about this book that are outstanding for me. The first of them is the way that Beryl Bainbridge has taken a real life historical event and real life historical people and fictionalised the story, turned it into a work of fiction. And that just excited me so much when I first thought, well, why not? You know, there, there is a story to be told within the real story. We have lots of non-fiction accounts, we have diaries, we have letters, uh, we know a lot about what happened. But by fictionalising it, um, Belle Bainbridge gave herself licence to imagine what it was like to be those men, what it was like to be there, and to fill in the gaps using her imagination. She doesn't claim that it's historically accurate, that we know exactly what these people were thinking and feeling, of course we couldn't. But she uses the facts to then grow out of that a story that is so convincing. You really think she does know somehow what those people were thinking. And that's the other thing that I think is so strong in this book. And it's a theme throughout the three books that I've picked to show you today. Um, it's the strength of the character development, the way she's taken what little she knew and then really created these characters that you just you just totally believe and you feel their terror and their sorrow and their courage and their blind faith in what they're doing and it, and it is a really tragic book. Um, the themes in this book are, are really wide as well and they, it is looking at what was coming because this was written um, in 1991 but it was set in, uh, the expedition was in 1912 so we know with our wonderful clear hindsight that the First World War and all that blind faith and courage that was going to lead to such carnage and devastation of a whole generation of young men was about to happen. And it's it's here, it's in this book, um, that idea that people could be led for all the right reasons, they could go out of courage to do something that was incredibly dangerous and incredibly testing and challenging and that faith could doom them. You know, it, it was enough to be so, I, I think it was, it, the relationships between the men in this book are fascinating, but the one thing they have, even if they question his wisdom from time to time, is a belief in their leader and that they're doing the right thing for the right reasons. And that really shines through the book. Um, and the other thing that I think with this particular book that I find so powerful, is the descriptions of the ice and the snow and the cold and the conditions that these men endured, um, the gradual loss of hope that they had through what they were doing and how each of the different characters responded to that loss of hope in those conditions, in that wilderness. I've always had a bit of a, um, a love for books that take people to far-flung places, probably because I'm a really poor traveller and don't go anywhere. Um, and a lot of my favourite books will involve adventures, distant travel, journeys, whether doomed or otherwise. And Beryl Bainbridge has really, my goodness, got under the skin of these men in those circumstances. They are as far away from home as they could get. 
and you feel that loneliness, that aloneness in them. I can't recommend it highly enough. And how has it inspired me? Well, it set the bar really high for characterization and for description of place and setting, which for me is something I, I love to do with my books. Um, it also gave me the idea that taking people whose lives were real and fictionalizing the accounts to fill in those bits we don't know about is a wonderful thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do, having done it, I can tell you, but it, it is a wonderful challenge and, and a real way that a writer can stretch themselves and, and give their readers a new experience because, you know, when you put on the book based on a true story or on a film based on real life events, it gives the thing a whole different feeling. I mean, I, I'm sure you feel that when you watch a film or read a book and it says, you know, this is based on a true story. You think, my goodness, not only is this an amazing story, but it really happened. Most of what happened here is based on truth, um, real life events, and the story has grown out of that. So this book in particular inspired me to, to look at that business of writing from a real life. And I have a new project coming up, which I will be sharing with you and telling you about in a few weeks that very much grew out of that idea of looking at real lives and taking them into the world of, of fiction. So that one is Beryl Brain Bainbridge, sorry Beryl, Beryl Bainbridge, The Birthday Boys. And she's written lots of wonderful books, but if you only choose one Beryl Bainbridge book to read, I recommend it. It's this one, okay. If The Birthday Boys is a book about courage, the next book that I've selected to share with you is a book about cruelty. It's sold to us very much as a love story, and it is a love story, but I think at the heart of this book is about how badly people can treat people. Let's see if you can guess which book this is. It's very famous. It's been made into films. It's been made into television series. It's set in the 19th century on a wild and desolate place. It features a brooding hero and um, a wild heroine. Um, it's a tale of love that stretches beyond the grave. It is Wuthering Heights, Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. Um, lots has been written and said about this book. Uh, we could do a whole series of videos just on the structure because it's really unusual. Maybe we'll come back to that when we look at unusual structures in books um, and points of view and narrators because all that for me is fascinating. Just from the point of view as a reader, not looking to write from it, but just looking to find what this book is about. Yes, it's a love story, but I also think it is a book about how people use other people and how cruelty begets cruelty. Um, and, 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 and that does sort of make it really current, this idea of um, somebody who suffered in their, in their childhood, maybe that coming out in their in their adult life and how they treat other people. They always say that bullies have been bullied at some point. Um, often people in abusive marriages, the partner who is being abusive is being given a hard time at work or has had that in his past or her past. And I think <laughs> this is, you know, if you want to be a psychiatrist or psychologist, you can't get there without reading this book first. Has it inspired me as a writer? Yes, it has, because there are so many gaps. Um, the obvious one is where did Heathcliff go for those years when he disappears without spoilers, when he disappears at um, a point in the book and is gone for years and then comes back a wealthy man. Where'd he go? And what do he do? We all want to know. Um, that's an obvious place to write another story and it's it's been done and to good effect I think. But I have been inspired by actually Heathcliff's origins. So I'm I'm working on a screenplay at the moment that is based on Heathcliff's origins, on his childhood, and and a sideways step from that. And I don't want to give any more away at this moment. But it was the character of Heathcliff. It was this idea of nature versus nurture in producing a person. I mean, how much of how Heathcliff turned out was to do with the terrible cruelty that he suffered actually when he, he came to Wuthering Heights or his own makeup and his genetics, uh, we don't know about his parents, or to do with the early years he was rescued um, by um, Earnshaw as a boy, what had happened to him before that, what had happened to shape him. So that has inspired me to write um, a 
a screenplay, in fact, rather than a book. I've, I'm writing a film based on his early years and a sideways step from that. And as I say, I'll tell you more about that in another video. The third book I want to share with you today might be a little less known, and it is, it's my old, old battered copy, Candide by Voltaire. Okay, this book was written in 1759, <laughs> not very current. Um, actually, this copy looks rather as if it was printed then, but it wasn't. It, there's no date in this edition, so I don't know when it was, was printed, this one, but it is, I should think, easily 80 or 90 years old, this, this, this edition in itself. Um, and it's nice, I, I keep it by my bed, <laughs> I dip into it, um, which is why it actually has its own, own little bookmark that I made for it. Um, Candide was written by Voltaire, as I said, in 1759, and it is very much a novel of the Enlightenment. Voltaire um, was a philosopher first and a writer second, really, and he lived an amazing life, and that's another story in itself. Um, but this was his satire on the political beliefs and the philosophical beliefs and the theological beliefs of the time. It's a very rich book. There is a lot in here going on. But first and foremost, and this has been made into a musical, um, it's a comedy. It's written as a really rollicking read. I mean, it, it, even though it is hundreds of years old, it makes me laugh. It still makes me laugh. And the madness of it, the, the scope of the comedy, really inspired me. I read quite a lot of comedy when I was younger. I read uh, a lot of Evelyn Waugh, which is a very dark comedy. I read a lot of Woodhouse. Um, but this was the book that really made me think, you can just be off the wall with your comedy. I mean, they were doing it then. And it still has depth. It still has meaning. Comedy doesn't have to be frivolous. It can be a really effective way of getting your, your message across without being preachy. And, and there's nothing preachy in this book. It is funny and I highly recommend it. So if you haven't tried Candide by Voltaire, give it a go. It inspired me to write my series of books about Detective Gretel. Um, she's a very cynical person, Gretel, and is the sort of opposite of the main character in here. The main character in here is um, a very, uh, Candide himself is, is, is a very optimistic, um, upbeat young man who's lived a lovely life in a castle to begin with and then things all start to go horribly wrong but while he's being brought up he is instructed by somebody called Professor Pangloss and the clue is in the name and he is a, a a lethal optimist if such a thing can be in fact the the um, one of the other names for the book is L'Optimiste or in, in, in English it tended to be translated into um, it was in a, um, the history of Candide or all for the best uh, the best of all possible worlds. Um, basically, uh, Voltaire was taking issue with this whole Leibniz theory that <clears throat> we have the best of all possible worlds, everything is designed to be the best it possibly can be. And so poor old Candide goes out into the world with this lovely, optimistic, skipping idea that everything is wonderful and will be fine. And it very quickly isn't fine, it gets worse and worse and worse. And it, it reminds me a bit now, a little bit, perhaps of the Monty Python uh, films where it doesn't matter how bad things get, so people are always upbeat and it's always going to be fine and, and you must see the good in everything to a ridiculous level. And, and Voltaire's idea was that, you know, we are ignoring all the terrible things and just putting a gloss over everything, hence Professor Pangloss. Um, but if you haven't tried it, and I, I highly recommend it, give it a go, okay? And it certainly inspired me to be quite out there with my comedy. Um, which is why the, the Gretel books are not just vaguely comic, they are ridiculously comic, and, and that was what I was trying to do. So that's my third favourite book for you today, is Candide. I'd love to know about some of your favourite books. Um, I'm going to be giving you different ones in these videos, and I will give you the, uh, the details um, somewhere around here, so you can look at it and find it back in the video. Um, and I'd like to hear what your favourite books are and why and whether they've influenced your writing or inspired you. I've got lots more to share with you, but I'll probably do three at a time so that we can look at them in a bit more depth. Don't forget to uh, subscribe if you haven't already and press the little bell notification thing in me jiggy me. And then when I pop up with these extra ones, um, you'll get to hear about them. And uh, yeah, tell me what your what the most influential books have been in, in your reading career and uh, 
if like me your your favorites change from month to month then uh, there's an endless supply so uh, happy reading <laughs>